I'd like to call the April meeting of the Sacramento Environmental Commission to order. Uh, would you please read the roll call, please? Mark Berry. Richard Hun. Here. Diane Kinderman. Here. George Buzzlink. Here. Dr. Anthony DeRiggi. Here. Margie Namba. Laura Nickerson. Here. Eric Rivero Montes. Mark White. Kelly McCoy. Here. So tonight we do not have a quorum, but because we're mandated to meet on a monthly basis, we will continue the meeting, but take no formal actions requiring a vote of the commission this evening. Uh, what I'd like to quickly do is have a introductions of the commissioners. Uh, please introduce yourselves and tell us who you're representing. Tony? Uh, Tony DeRigi, a uh, retired pediatrician from Kaiser Permanente, representing the city of Sacramento. Yeah, I'm Buzz Link. I'm a registered civil engineer. So my interest is water primarily here. I'm a Sacramento County appointee. I'm Richard Hun. I'm a consulting and environmental planner, and I'm representing Sacramento County. I'm Diane Kinderman. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Abbott and Kinderman practicing land use, environmental, and real estate law, and I am a city of Sacramento appointee to the commission. My name is Laura Nickerson. I'm a registered nurse currently working for Sutter Health. I'm also a wildlife rescue and rehabilitator, and I represent the county of Sacramento. Thank you. I'm Kelly McCoy, sitting in for Marie Wooden, who is support to the commission. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, this is an opportunity now for receiving any public comment. If anybody would like to address the commission on any matters, they can approach the podium and uh, make the statement. Seeing none, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is our annual environmental awards presentations. Uh, this award's been going on for close to 10 years now, and uh, it's been very successful, and we are very excited about it every year. Um, before we initiate the, uh, the award ceremony, we'd like to uh, hear Mr. Jeff Harris, if you'd like to approach the commission and make a statement about the awards commission. Well, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. It's um, kind of unique for me to be on this side of the podium. I like it. Mm -hmm. um, tonight you're giving away environmental awards, and one of the awardees is Corey Brown, who happens to be somebody who I've worked with extensively on the Lower American River Parkway Conservancy Program. Corey came into my office. I'm a city council member for District 3 here in Sacramento. Uh, he came into my office about three years ago, and said, we need a conservancy. And I said, for what? And he continued to educate me about riparian issues and how we were losing a lot of money here in the Sacramento area because we didn't have a receiving body for park and water bond money to bolster our American River Parkway and do environmental stewardship. Uh, so we collaborated. We got the city on board. We got Assemblymember McCarty on board. and. Lo and behold, it's become law. We now have a conservancy program, and I'm proud to say I'm chair of the committee. We already have $10 million to work with to do restorations, acquisitions uh, on the parkway. And um, it's very exciting. You know, we've never had this kind of, uh, these kinds of funds to work with to enhance our American River Parkway, which of course is the jewel of our community. So I was very pleased to nominate Corey, and um, I'm excited to be here tonight. So thank you for your time. Thanks for your words. Thank you. Given that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to uh, Diane uh, Kinderman, and she'll make the uh, a presentation of the awards, and I'll come down and we'll pan out the box directly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Richard. Um, we want to thank everyone who submitted, who recommended someone to receive an award and to those who submitted awards um, this year. There are a handful of recipients of certificates that may or may not be in the audience. If you are, feel, you're, feel free to stand up, perhaps. We can applaud you. Maybe not. You did. Good job. <laughs> that, but in, in, Thank you. But in terms of the outstanding awards, it's a difficult decision. We just can't give everybody one of these specific types of awards, but we do 
um, recognized with a special certificate, other, um, other submissions. And so thank you again, we appreciate your submission. And um, any of you who were all out in the environmental community, if you know anyone next year or an organization that might be worthy of um, one of these awards, we are happy to direct them to um, our awards application on our website. And, and we want to continue to educate everyone in Sacramento County and the region about all the good works people are doing in our community. So with that, thank you for um, your submission and uh, congratulations on your certificate and to all the other certificate holders. And with that, we'll go on to the outstanding awards. And we will start with the gentleman that Council Member Harris recommended, and his name is Mr. Corey Brown. And he's been an, an active in environmental causes for many years and was a key component, as Council Member Harris said, in the formation of the Lower American River Parkway Conservancy, which will protect and enhance the Lower American River Parkway for years to come. He serves as a strategic policy advisor and program officer with the Resources Legacy Fund covering a diverse portfolio of issues, including climate change, land use, park protection, urban rivers, and river restoration. Previously, Mr. Brown served as executive director of the Big Sur Land Trust, government affairs director for the Trust for Public Land in the Western Region, general counsel for the Planning and Conservation League, legal counsel for Friends of the River, and assembly fellow with the California State Legislature. He also served as an adjunct professor at the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law and is a visiting lecturer at UC Davis. And with that, Mr. Brown, would you like to step forward and accept your award? Thank you again for your generous contributions. Would you like to say something? Wonderful. Oh, yes, very briefly. I, I want to thank the commission very much for this honor. It's a great honor, especially to be a, a resident of Sacramento for so many years. The American River Parkway really is a tremendous jewel. I've worked on parkway, river parkway projects around the state, and all the other communities look to Sacramento County and City of Sacramento for what we've done in terms of preserving the Lower American River and making it available to so many children and so many community uh, residents. Uh, you're receiving five or eight million visitor days per year is, is truly remarkable. And folks that are working on Los Angeles River, or the San Joaquin River, or many other river parkways really look to this county and the cities here for inspiration. So it's a real pleasure to have worked with Councilman Harris, uh, uh, Assemblyman McCarty and the county supervisors to help establish the uh, Lower American River Conservancy program. We believe that $10 million is just the beginning and it can help us serve that important goal of leaving our children and future generations with an even better parkway than we found ourselves. So thank you again and again, I really treasure this, uh, this honor. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Brown, for your wonderful contributions to the community and for creating a template for others to follow. Thank you. All right, so our next award is goes to the Sacramento Audubon Society for its outstanding environmental education programs, including the Environmental Education Program for Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps and their participation in the 2018 Nature Bowl competition. And maybe someone can tell us more about that if they would like to when they come up. The goal of their education program is to enhance core members' understanding, appreciation, and respect for the environment in which they work through rotating classroom sessions and field sessions. Core members help maintain pedestrian pathways at the Bobolane Sanctuary, and through the educational programs provided by the Audubon Society, they may share their knowledge with others and become better stewards and ambassadors of the environment.
The Audubon Society also participated in the 2018 Nature Bowl semifinals competition at Pollock Pines, reaching 118 students from nine schools. The Nature Bowl is a fun science-based event for elementary age students promoting activities which challenge students' knowledge of the environment, habitat, and conservation. Accepting the award on behalf of the Audubon Society are William Bianco, President of the Sacramento Audubon Society, and Gessna Clark, Education Committee Chairman. Just a few words, thank you. Uh, on behalf of our membership, uh, very pleased to accept this award and uh, I'd like to thank the Sacramento Environmental Commission and the people of Sacramento County. And uh, Gessner Clark, our education chairperson, uh, deserves a great credit for both these projects for making the two education programs so successful. And we have a few other um, Acknowledgements for the Nature Bowl. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kelly Hopkins. She's the executive director of the Sacramento Valley Conservancy, and uh, we uh, helped us with the Camp Pollock site for the Nature Bowl. And also, her team uh, worked closely with us, Sacramento Audubon, to ensure the site facilities worked for the event. And there's a few other. Education committee members that I'd like to acknowledge are in our planning team members is uh, Kathleen Lazier and uh, Sue Darst. And uh, the other project, the Environmental Education Program for the Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps. This, uh, we had the help of Norma, Norma Naylor, the Director of Corps Member Development and Education. And uh, she was very cooperative with the uh, Sacramento Audubon Education Chair on the program focus and scheduling. So uh, both uh, projects are very good and they're ongoing. We just keep moving with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I say something. I just like to say that it just was has been a pleasure to work with both of these projects and to work with young people. Um, I'm a past educator and children are so important to me. And also my passion for nature is one of my driving forces as well. And just to be able to work with uh, Bill and other members of the Sacramento Audubon Society in, in a way that we can go out and we can help people learn more, one, about birds and the environment and um, participate with people from different agencies who have a similar passion really is an important thing to us. So it was a pleasure to work on these projects and we're just really thrilled to um, receive this uh, wonderful award from you. Thank you so very much. You are very welcome and thank you Ms. Clark and Mr. Bianco. Thank you both for your efforts leaving legacies for the future and for educating our children. Thank you. Okay, so our third award of the night goes to the Sacramento Municipal Utility District for Outstanding Environmental Leadership for best practices, safe handling, and emission reduction of sulfur hexafluoride. It's called SF6 for those of you who are chemistry um, geeks, so to speak. As part of its daily operations, SMUD manages over 400 circuit breakers and switch gears containing SF6 gas. SF6 is a very potent greenhouse gas used as an insulating medium to prevent electric discharges in high voltage applications, including SMUD substations and transmission equipment. With a global warming potential of 23,000 500 times greater than that of carbon dioxide, even relatively small amounts of SF6 can have a significant impact on global climate change. So it's important to minimize these emissions. In 2010, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, 
imposed a maximum annual emission rate for SF6 emissions. SMUD has consistently maintained its SF6 emissions well below CARB's maximum limits through its outstanding best management practices and emission reduction efforts. SMUD is also considered an industry leader in SF6 emissions reduction and helps educate other entities so that they can reduce their emissions also. So accepting the award is SMUD Board President Dave Tomeo, along with Patrick Durham, Penny Luce, Martha Hellick, Arna Arnaldi Rustandi, Matt Wheel, and Tim Tutt. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, you know, it, it really is an honor to be here uh, to receive the award on, on behalf of SMUD. And I, I definitely want to point out that this is a, as the result of a lot of hard work by our staff, both our environmental staff and our uh, um, electrical operations staff who really, who really make this work. So I'm just the president of the board, and I don't do the work. It's staff that does the work, and they're the ones that, that really are receiving this award. So, and I do speak for our entire organization in saying that we really appreciate the work that your commission has done uh, in promoting sustainability and environmental stewardship throughout the Sacramento region. And your reputation makes receiving an award from you that much more meaningful. So the, the reduction of, of the uh, sulfur hexafluoride is one example of SMUD's commitment to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also showing environmental leadership in, in, in the many different ways that we affect the environment. Um, you already had mentioned how potent this greenhouse gas uh, is and um, so you know, we don't have a lot of it, but whatever gets out is really important. So we're, we're doing the best that we can to, to, uh, to keep it contained. Um, and I also wanted to point out um, that we're doing a lot to reduce greenhouse gases in our overall operations. We're, uh, as many folks like to point out, we are the largest greenhouse gas emitter in Sacramento County, but that's because we, we, we provide electricity to a million and a half people here. So it's very important that we pay attention to how we reach our greenhouse goal reductions. And SMUD is committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to 60% below 1990 levels by 2030 and achieving a net zero um, greenhouse gas footprint by 2040, which is ahead of the, uh, of the state goals. We're not doing this because the state's telling us to, we're doing it because it's a key part of, of SMUD's commitment to improving the, the quality of life of our community. And we all know what a threat uh, climate change is to the community. And so um, we, we take this um, responsibility very seriously and we're working hard. We're prepared to make some very large investments over the next 20 years to make that happen. And for those of us, for those uh, who uh, want to know why we're putting all this time and effort and investment into making sure that we reach that uh, reach those goals and the answer really is we can't afford not to do it so we're committed for the long haul and we appreciate your recognition and thank you very much thank you so much
We appreciate your leadership on the board in this direction and staff's at vi vigilance and dedication. Um, SMUD never, um, oh, never um, disappoints us in the environmental arena. Every year you submit some um, uh, wonderful um, uh, example of environmental efforts that you're pursuing at SMUD, and we really appreciate that. Thank you all. All right, so our next and final award of the evening is um, the California State University at Sacramento for Outstanding Environmental Leadership for its newly constructed parking structure number five. This structure was named 2018 Innovative Sustainability Project of the Year from the National Parking Association, and it incorporated many innovations to minimize its environmental impact. The following are just a few of the highlights of the structure. For example, there are many dry wells and bioswales to divert storm water runoff into the ground, tree planting that exceeded the number of trees needed to be removed due, due to ill health and construction. Trees were retained by the University Sustainability Group for research and design projects. Parking count system at the main entry point of the structure, reducing needless driving and idling time. Prefab construction system fabricated off-site, reducing construction time by nine months. EV charging stations and clean air vehicle designated spaces and abundant bike, bicycle parking. And accepting this award is Tanya Nunez, project manager in the planning design and construction at Cal State University, Sacramento, and the team including Vic, Victor Takahashi, director of planning, design, and construction, Tony Lucas, Senior Director of the University Support Services, Terry Street, General Manager, and Farid Ibrahim, Director of Clark, from Clark Pacific, John Weber, President, and Jim Ger Thompson, Project Designer for Dreyfus and Blackford. Thank you all. Distinguished members of the commission, uh, Council Member Harris, uh, fellow awardees, and of course my team, I'm honored to accept this award on behalf of Sacramento State's uh, 31,000 students, quite a few commuters, of course, um, and our uh, 6,000 faculty staff, students, uh, excuse me, faculty, staff, and community. Um, this parking structure uh, represents Sacramento State's continued uh, commitment towards sustainable construction. Um, I think uh, if you go by and look at the structure, we've done a few things that are a little bit unique in our structure. Uh, the parking guidance system will help reduce idle, uh, <coughs> idling in the structure and gets the student and our staff member directly to that space instead of driving around looking for them. So I think you can all re uh, relate to that. We also integrated um, a number of alternative transportation techniques into the structure. Um, recently, you may have heard about us uh, featuring the Ali Autonomous Vehicle that is stored in this facility. It also launches from this facility. We have an intra-campus circulator that helps uh, uh, people with uh, mobility limitations get around the campus, and we're really close to our regional transit stop uh, within uh, probably 100 yards of our structure. We've integrated a number of sustainability uh, techniques, such as having low intrusive devices to collect the water uh, so there's no storm water runoff, and so we continue to preserve this uh, wonderful parkway and the uh, and the birds. <laughs> and so uh, we're just honored to be here and accept this award for on behalf of Sacramento State. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. I also want to say thank you. I'm Ginger with Dreyfus and Blackford, and. Um, I wanted to mention what an awesome opportunity it was to be on a project as utilitarian as a parking structure is. 
but teamed up with the Sac State crew and the Clark Pacific people who collectively we all focused on elevating that structure to something so much more. So the sustainability features are not just superficial, they're all the way from the very beginning of the project. They were put a lot of thought and energy and uh, engineering into making sure it's as thorough from parking stalls, counts, all the way to being able to see all the way through the structure and having like complete open air. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you and also thank you to the team. Good. Thank you. And, and thank you again to the university for continuing to be a sustainability leader in our community. We've received applications for, uh, for awards from you in prior years and have been happy to provide them to you. And thank you to the design team that did such a great job and, as you say, elevated the parking structure. But th So thank you once again. Congratulations. Well, that concludes our award ceremony. So what I'd like to do is get a round of applause for all the awardees who attended here tonight. Thank you. Our next agenda item is a uh, uh, Mr. Gary Goodman from the Yellow Mosquito and Vector Control District. Uh, luckily, we've been able to get Gary to come to us and speak to us on an annual basis, uh, mainly because this time of year is very important for being aware of the hazards and threats associated with the mosquitoes and other vectors. So Gary, it's good to see you again, and yes. thank you. Take it away. Excuse me, thank you very much for the invitation, and, and clearly this is the time where everybody exits, so um, <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's what I get. Yeah, so you guys are here, thank you very much. So we, we do appreciate, uh, my name's Gary Goodman, I'm the general manager of the Sacramento Yolo Mosquito Vector Control District, and I do always appreciate the invitation to come out because we know that other people are watching out there, we wanna make sure that we're trying to do the best we can to spread the word about the issues associated with uh, mosquito production and prevention of disease, and simple things that uh, the general public can do to try to, to help prevent um, disease transmission here in Sacramento and Yolo County. So um, our district, uh, we do cover all of Sacramento and Yolo County and in, in California, there are about 65 other mosquito control districts up and down the state. Uh, and for the most part, wherever anybody lives, there typically is a mosquito control district to try to help protect, protect them from diseases, um, specifically things like West Nile, but other ones, uh, ex more exotic diseases that we're starting to get um, into the United States. And our area is very diverse from the perspective of Sacramento County is, is um, all the way from the Delta um, to urban Sacramento and then on the other side of the river you have Yolo County so you have a lot of agriculture that produces mosquitoes and of course mosquitoes don't necessarily stay where they're born they fly uh, they can fly over the river so we have a lot of mosquito production that happens on in some of our agricultural areas that have a direct impact on our residents of um, Sacramento and Yolo County and specifically a challenge for us are places like uh, Davis and Winters and, and Woodland which are really islands um, of population surrounded by agriculture so they're really getting it from from all sides from that perspective. Um, our district, again, it's a, another map. We're broken up into various zones, and so we have a technician um, that works in each one of these particular areas, and their job on a daily basis is to go around and look for standing water and mosquito breeding sites, um, do service requests um, for those folks that call us to ask for service. Uh, but their job specifically is to try to look for and treat any mosquito breeding sites that are in their, their particular zone. Um, for the district species, um, in California there are, uh, worldwide there are about 3,500 different species of mosquitoes. Um, not all of them transmit disease um, and all of them, and uh, some of them have very specific feeding habits as well. Some um, feed on mammals, some feed on birds, some feed on, uh, there's one in South America that feeds on a very specific type of frog, that's all it eats. Um, doesn't eat the frog, eats the blood. Um, here in California we have 53 different species of mosquitoes um, and in Sacramento and Yolo County we have about 24. Um, and so we look at uh, the different populations of these particular species of mosquitoes and clearly the ones that transmit disease are the ones that we're most concerned about but mosquito production in general has an impact, uh, economic impact in terms of quality of life, um, economic issues which is really is why back in uh, uh, over 100 years ago, 1915, the Mosquito Abatement Act of California was actually um, uh, uh, enacted was essentially was the economic impact of um, mosquitoes in and around
around where people wanted to live. Um, uh, specifically down in the Bay Area, uh, that was uninhabitable uh, due to the ma matter of wetlands and marshes that were out there. Um, and so they, they put together an, abac to, uh, an abatement act to essentially form districts um, so that we could go in there and try to abate those mosquitoes and ma actually make it livable. Um, now, of course, if you had bought something back in 1915 in, in the Bay Area, you'd, you'd be a very rich person at this moment in time. Um, so wanted to talk just briefly uh, mosquito life cycle. There are four development stages. Um, one, only the female mosquito bites. Um, they need the protein in your blood to produce the eggs. Uh, male mosquitoes just feed on nectar. Um, so they are actually small pollinators. Um, uh, so actually some level of beneficial use. Um, they go through four stages. So they'll lay eggs anywhere from 150 to 250 eggs at a time, um, typically in rafts like you see there on the screen. Then they'll go through four larval stages, a pupil stage, and then emerge as an adult, and then start the cycle all over again. So our main focus, as I mentioned, is those technicians out in the zones um, look specifically for breeding sources because we try to target them in their aquatic stage because the more we can kind of take care of in the aquatic stage the less adults that we have which means the less adults that we have feeding on people and starting that whole cycle of 150 to 250 eggs at a time. So uh, here's a picture of, of an egg graph specifically um, uh, when they first start to come out. Uh, well. You can see the, the white coming out on the top picture there. They first start to come out, they're white, and then they'll start to discolor into a more of a brown, but that's that egg graft that we're looking for. Um, and it usually takes anywhere from egg to adult, specifically in the summertime with warm water and warm weather, um, anywhere from about seven to 10 days to go from egg to adult. And some species are a little bit faster and some species are a little bit slower, but for the ones that we're concerned about, anywhere about a week, which is why the messages that we try to get out to the general public are, um, don't produce or drain any standing water that you may have in your yard about once a week. Um, again, uh, depending on the specific species of mosquito, three to five days for floodwater mosquitoes, um, 80s. Um, the Culex species um, that we have are our most uh, um, uh, disease transmitting um, mosquitoes that we have. Um, those take anywhere from seven to 10 days. And then um, for our rice field mosquitoes, um, and we have a lot of rice in Sacramento and Yolo County, um, takes a little bit longer from that egg to adult process. Um, again, feeding habits, only the female mosquitoes bite, males feed on uh, plant juices and nectar. Um, and so what attracts mosquitoes? So essentially what happens there is that as we are talking, uh, we, as we are breathing, we're exhaling carbon dioxide. And that essentially is what a mosquito, when they're host seeking, is looking for. They're looking to try to find that carbon dioxide knowing that they can then find the source to be able to find the warm body to be able to take that blood meal. Um, so different factors that lead to mosquito production or, or mosquito attraction, perspiration, warmth, body odor, all of those things, mosquitoes can kind of pick up uh, what those are and be able to find you. I know a lot of folks say, I get every time I walk in the park, I just get chewed alive and yet my spouse or my child doesn't get eaten at all. Um, part of that may be maybe you're talking too much um, and admitting too much carbon dioxide. Uh, maybe you're sweating a little bit too much. So everybody has a little bit different, but these are some of the factors that, uh, that, that bring into mosquito attraction. Uh, mosquitoes most are most active um, uh, dusk and dawn for specifically the Culex and Anopheles species. Uh, we are starting to see these 80 species, which are daytime biters. Um, and so if you're being bothered in the middle of the daytime, they're probably a particular species of mosquito, which is why when folks call us for, um, for questions about mosquito production or say, am I being bitten, we always ask the questions, are you being bitten at night? Are you being bitten in the morning? Are you being bitten in the day? Because that will tell us specifically what type of mosquito we might be looking for. And then specifically the breeding habits of those mosquitoes are where we might find those mosquitoes if we come do an inspection around the yard. Um, we do here in Sacramento and Yolo County have mosquitoes year round, unfortunately. We don't get that cold, we don't get that, vi um, we don't get snow, we don't get a really uh, hard cold snap. Um, especially in the last few years, our winters have been very, very mild. Um, so uh, as a mosquito control um, expert, we are always looking for those two or three weeks of very, very cold weather, um, freezing pipes, all of those things makes for great news stories, but also helps suppress mosquito and, and insect populations. We haven't had that in the last few years in very mild winters. Um, how long do mosquitoes live? Uh, depends on, again, the species, but uh, in the summer, about two weeks. And in that cycle of two weeks uh, time frame, specifically for these disease mosquitoes, they can take anywhere from two to three to four blood meals. So um, they can transmit disease very quickly just in that short time frame that they have. But we have some species that will last year round or over the winter. Um, in the winter time, and specifically here now that we're in the spring, in February, we usually get that warm weather. Uh, there's about a week where the sun comes out and everybody starts going out in shorts and t-shirts. 
in their garage and they're standing there going, man, I'm getting hammered by mosquitoes. And that's because those mosquitoes essentially overwinter. And as soon as the sun comes out, they're hungry, right? So they've been hunkered down for quite some time. Now all of a sudden they're looking for that blood meal. And of course, when the weather's warm and people are wearing shorts and t-shirts, you notice it more than if you were wearing long sleeves. Uh, so how far can mosquitoes fly? So certain species, again, depends on the species that we have. Um, some fly just a few blocks, maybe up to a mile, um, but some can travel miles, um, 10 to 15 miles in an evening. Um, Anopheles freebrini and Aedes melanomon. Um, these are very big mosquitoes. Anopheles freebrini is the uh, a malaria mosquito um, that's bred in the, in the rice fields. And so we can get very large, long distances of mosquito. Um, and so again, it depends on which ones are being bitten as to what kind of sources we're going to look for to be able to try to control. Um, those mosquitoes. Uh, January to February, this is when uh, you know mosquito season begins for us. It's always year-round, but we clearly have more activity in the summer months. Once the weather starts to warm up, we're starting to get that weather now. Of course, this rain isn't really helping um, in terms of mosquito production, but uh, right after this, we're supposed to have 80-degree weather by the weekend, um, and that's going to have an impact on mosquito production. And so we're anticipating a very busy year. But typically, March and April, when the temperatures start to warm, mosquitoes will start to come out, and then clearly from May through October is our our disease transmission months. So that's the time when the, the virus is going to amplify in, in both the bird population and in the mosquito population, and that's when we're, people are going to be outside, and that's where we're going to have our largest risk of, of transmission. So clearly, the mosquitoes of concern, this is what we're trying to avoid, is that when you go outside, you're not just being inundated with mosquitoes on a regular basis. Um, luckily, these pictures were not taken anywhere near our district. These are, these are from another district that doesn't do quite as good a job as we do. I won't name them. Um, so I just want to talk about a few species of uh, mosquitoes of concern again. The Anopheles mosquito, I think I mentioned, this is the rice field mosquito. Um, it overwinters as an adult in late fall. Um, in the first warm days of the winter, um, they become very aggressive because they've been hunkered down and they're very hungry. Um, and so we also have uh, Aedes syriensis. This is a tree hole mosquito, which is very active now in the springtime. This one is responsible for the transmission of dog heartworm, and you'll start to see this again in March and April. Um, and these breed in tree holes. So when the rain comes over the winter time, you get these little knots in the trees um, that fill up with water and that's exactly where these mosquitoes lay their eggs and so their eggs are viable um, even when there's not water in there they essentially wait for that water to fill up and so that's why they they come out so they'll, they'll lay their eggs in early summer and then they kind of those these mosquitoes kind of go away their eggs are still viable when those rains come and fill those tree holes up then all of a sudden those mosquitoes will start to hatch and so it's not something so the eggs for a lot of these mosquito species are viable for months and months uh, they'll lay the eggs and, let, and essentially are waiting for um, water to activate them, so to speak. Um, again, I, I think I mentioned Culex species. We have both Culex tarsalis and Culex pipians. These are the ones that transmit specifically West Nile virus and very efficient vectors of West Nile virus. Um, West Nile virus is a bird disease, so it's transmitted or carried by birds, and mosquito bites an infected bird, picks it up, and then bites another bird, passes it on, or bites a human and passes it on. And that's how that transmission cycle goes through. Um, it also can transmit to horses, which is um, it's very detrimental to the horses. So there is a vaccine for horses, and we recommend any horse owners to get that vaccine because if your horse gets West Nile virus and you're unvaccinated, it's about a 50% survival and it's a very painful death because it's encephalitis like, so swelling of the brain, those types of things are very painful for the horses. So luckily there is a vaccine to be able to try to control them. We are also, in terms of um, species of concerns, getting invasive species. Um, this, uh, these uh, uh, mosquitoes are Aedes uh, aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These are typically mosquitoes that are found in, in, in South America, Central America, Mexico, um, in the southeast part of the United States. Um, warmer tend to be more humid climates, and we never really had these mosquito species in California until about 10 years ago. And so they unfortunately have established themselves. Um, we're lucky uh, to date, this is hopefully real wood, uh, we don't have them yet in Sacramento and Yolo County, but there are established colonies in Southern California, San Diego, um, uh, Fresno, and as close to us as Madero. So really very similar climate to what we have, um, and these mosquito species essentially are starting to move up. And so there was a mention earlier about climate change. That's having an impact, we think, on insects as well. And so mosquitoes are starting to adapt to different uh, areas where they normally weren't, weren't supposed to be. And so the issue associated with these particular species of mosquitoes is, uh, is they can transmit some of the existing 
exotic diseases that we have, uh, dengue, chikungunya, Zika virus, which was in the news a few years ago and still is a concern for us. And every year we get imported cases. So we always get cases of people that have traveled to an endemic area, got bitten by a mosquito um, for one of these diseases and then come back here and experience those symptoms. And so if we have these species of mosquitoes established here, then we can get local transmission similar to the West Vile, Nile, uh, West, Vi West Nile virus transmission cycle. And so these are something that we're concerned with and on constantly on the lookout and then of course working with other districts up and down the state that already have them established. So how do we do that? Um, our, we have a, uh, a, a, a nationwide world-renowned um, surveillance program. So we set traps throughout the district. We're looking at these traps specifically to try to figure out abundance levels. Are populations rising? Are they falling? And then of course we're doing virus surveillance testing as well. So we take the mosquitoes, we take them back to our lab, we separate them out by both sex and species, um, testing specifically those Culex species uh, that will transmit disease, um, and then if see if we find disease in that. We work uh, with the Sacramento County Public Health Lab. Um, uh, they have their facility um, off of Broadway. We actually have a piece PCR machine that's there and we do we have a microbiologist on site that does um, our PCR testing for that uh, we test about 7500 different species samples or um, pools during the course of the year um, which is a lot more than um, honestly anyone else in the state and a lot more than even a lot of states do in terms um, so we have a very excellent uh, a very good surveillance program overall and so this is just a general depiction of where our trap sites are located these are not all of our trap sites these are just a general understanding as to where we would go um, for uh, our weekly surveillance aspect um, so we have different types of traps and each different type of trap tra attracts a different type of mosquito so uh, the bottom right there is what we call a gravid trap, and this is a trap that's designed for mosquitoes that have already taken a blood meal and are looking to lay their eggs in a suitable location. So um, we put in that little basin some very nasty, foul-smelling water, which tr triggers to the mosquito that, hey, this is a suitable place that has nutrients and my, my eggs will survive, and so they'll lay their eggs there. When they lay their eggs, they get sucked up from a fan into that box, um, and then we can collect the mosquitoes there. Um, in the upper right corner, um, this is a brand new trap. This is one of what we call our locker trap. Um, this emits out CO2, so it, uh, we have a CO2 canister in there, and it'll burn that CO2 that creates that plume, and that's what mosquitoes, they are host-seeking mosquitoes, so they're fine, trying to find that blood meal, and we put these streams of carbon dioxide out in the field, and mosquitoes are attracted to that. Then we have in the middle there a tra traditional light trap, so similar to insects. All insects are attracted to light in some form or fashion, just like your porch light out front. Um, you get a lot of moths, but you also get a lot of mosquitoes that are attracted to that, so that's a different type of species of mosquito. And then the bottom left is our invasive species. So what we're looking for in terms of those 80s albopictus and 80s aegypti, those mosquitoes that we don't have here, that's the type of trap that will attract them. And we've actually developed one that, uh, that will run on a battery for a week long because we, we put a solar panel out for it. Um, so so it can charge itself all the way and we can leave these traps out for about a week or so um, and that way we're not, we're not losing manpower going out and checking the trap on a daily basis. Um, this trap also in the bottom left we're working with the company that manufactures it because uh, from an innovation standpoint, they're actually creating a smart trap, a trap that as a mosquito enters in, it breaks a beam of light and that beam of light is measuring its wing beat frequency. So it can tell us whether it's a mosquito or a larger insect or a smaller insect. Um, and we're working on trying to develop it with um, being able to identify specifically by the species. So that way we would know, and then that, that information is transmitted via website and we can find out in 15 minute increments what kind of populations we have at any particular um, location. So we're working actively with them on being able to measure wing beat frequencies of mosquitoes because an Anopheles mosquito that comes from the rice field is a much larger mosquito than say Culex pipians and so as it enters the trap it has a different wing beat frequency. So trying to be innovative in terms of uh, developing that so we can be more efficient and better at our jobs. Um, our encephalitis virus surveillance, this is uh, essentially our West Nile virus surveillance and, and these again are um, the canister that you see there in the middle picture is again we fill it with dry ice and that as that uh, melts off it burns off that carbon dioxide that's where mosquitoes are attracted there and then these mosquitoes are trapped live and so we'll pick them up and that way we can bring them back to the lab again um, sort them out by sex and species and then grind them up into a slurry and test them for virus surveillance. Um, again, the 80s albopictus, 80s aegypti mosquitoes, we put these in because uh, while I'm not necessarily an entomologist, we have an appreciation for the beauty of mosquitoes. So um, if, if I had a room full of entomologists, uh, they would be very interested 
And the, 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 the coloration of these particular mosquitoes, they're very striking um, when you can see them. But these are the troublesome ones that we're looking for that have yet to, uh, yet to come to our, our, our particular district. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a map of invasive species. So I've circled where Sacramento and Yolo County is. And then in yellow, you can see where established colonies of these particular species have already been. And so they're very similar climate to where we are. They're definitely moving their way up the state. Um, again, a closer look at these particular types of traps that attract um, these invasive species of mosquitoes. We put these out throughout the district and be able to try to identify if and when they may come to, to our district boundaries. Um, we also do immature mosquito surveillance. So we have, um, uh, when we go out to someone's house, we may look, um, if we find mosquitoes, we may bring some of these larvae. This is a close-up picture of what a mosquito larvae looks like in the water. Um, and we want to be able to try to identify which species that we may have in a particular area that allows us to drive our control program. Um, we also do pesticide resistance testing and management. So uh, we recognize that uh, the materials that we use um, are similar to the materials that are used by homeowners, materials that are used by farmers. Um, while we uh, are a very, very small percentage of the overall pesticide use, the impact of those pesticides has an impact on our ability to continue to try to control mosquitoes. And so we do active pesticide resistance testing um, and work closely with other agencies throughout uh, the state of California to be able to identify that and then rotate the product that we have. Unfortunately for adult mosquito control we really only have two products that we can use so you can only rotate between two uh, so many times. Um. We also do uh, on-site public health vector identification. So if a resident has, finds an insect, uh, we'll be able to identify it for them and give them some tools as to where they may be. We get a lot of fleas, we get a lot of flies, we get uh, different types of mosquitoes or different types of insects, but we have entomologists on site that will help uh, the public identify specifically what problem that they may have and then give them some um, ideas as to how to try to control those. So. Uh, we also have a state-of-the-art insectary. We actually have seven different colonies of mosquitoes that we breed. Um, so we breed mosquitoes at our facility down in Elk Grove. Um, you're more than welcome to come visit. We'll put you in the cage um, and then we'll see. It's almost like that money cage, you know, where they blow and all the monies. We put you in there with all the mosquitoes and see how many bites you get. Um, but we have seven different species of mosquitoes and we use these specifically to try to target our efficacy. So making sure that our products are going to work in various trials that we work with. Uh, we also work very closely with uh, UC, specifically UC Davis. Um, they're a world-renowned entomology program that's right here in our backyard. Um, we have a number of different projects that are ongoing with them to essentially just try to, to be more efficient and better at what it is that we do. Um, again, I think I mentioned uh, our partnership with the Sacramento County Public Health Lab. We have our PCR machine. It's our own machine, but we use their facility, so it's a nice partnership. Um, I think they had their facility uh, built uh, back with, with some of the 9-11 uh, money that was there to be able to try to um, establish you know, a, a, a site specifically to test for anthrax and other, other biologicals, and then we partnered with them to be able to try to utilize one of their rooms. So um, it's been a very good partnership over the last few years. Um, a list of kind of our laboratory programs, again, uh, adult mis uh, immature mosquito surveillance, the encephalitis uh, surveillance that we do for testing for diseases, um, the invasive species, malaria and dengue. Uh, we do yellow jacket surveillance as well, so that can be a public health hazard. Um, so if you're being bothered by yellow jackets, you can give us a call. We'll be more than happy to come out and take a look uh, and try to solve that problem for you. Uh, we also do tick and tick disease surveillance, so we test for Lyme disease. We do have Lyme disease within Sacramento and Yolo County. Most of it is centered around the American River Parkway and then up in Cache Creek. Um, and so we will post signs if we do find West, uh, Lyme disease uh, in a particular area. Uh, we don't, it's difficult, very di difficult to do tick control. Um, so we don't really control the ticks, but we at least try to identify where Lyme disease may be so that the, the people that are out hiking uh, will know and can take appropriate measurements. Um, Africanized honeybee surveillance, um, public health identification, pesticide resistance, and of course research and special projects as I mentioned. Um, again, working very closely with UC, um, other universities, and of course manufacturers and industry as they get with new products, we, we're more than happy to try to help test them uh, to make sure that they're going to be efficacious for us. Uh, so I mentioned mosquito transmitted diseases, malaria, Zika, chikungunya, dog heartworm, encephalitis. Uh, there's Western equine encephalitis and St. Louis encephalitis. Uh, St. Louis encephalitis is something that we had in California up until about West Nile came, uh, which was about 15 years ago. Um, and then St. Louis kind of went away for a little while. Well, it's starting to now reemerge. And so we've got some areas down in, in the Coachella Valley and starting to come up in the, into the um, uh, uh, 
the central part of the state that is uh, having a resurgence or reintroduction of St. Louis encephalitis. Um, and so that's something else that we monitor for and track. We haven't had any cases here in Sacramento and Yolo County um, in quite some time, but it is something that's coming. Um, and then, of course, the next one's yet to be determined. There are a lot of different vector-borne diseases that are out there in the world. Um, the world is very small. Uh, within you know eight hours, you can be on the other side of the planet, uh, and then you can transmit those things back. Uh, and so that's a, definitely a concern. You know, Zika, chikungunya, these were not diseases that, you know, that, that they, well, they were known diseases, but they were never anything that we had to deal with here in the United States. And yet all of a sudden, here they are. Um, and so there are other ones that are out there, um, some very dangerous ones that clearly we'll want to try to keep track of. And that's why we work very closely with, uh, with researchers you see um, in the CDC on being able to try to have a good solid surveillance program um, so they know what's happening here in California and specifically with our, within our district. Uh, West Nile virus uh, activity in California. Last year, uh, the number of human cases that were reported in California was 218, a sharp decline from what we had um, in previous years. Uh, part of that, we think, was due to a little bit to the drought kind of being over um, and the fact that we had more water, which is a bit counterintuitive because what happened, we ended up having more mosquitoes. Um, but because mosquitoes, or West Nile specifically, is a bird disease, uh, when we had the drought years, the issue was is wherever you did have water, you had the congregation of both birds and mosquitoes in the same place. Now that you are out of a drought, you have more water, so you have more mosquito breeding sites, but now you don't have as much interaction between the host of the, of the bird and the mosquitoes per se. And so we actually we saw we've been seeing a reduction in West Nile virus activity, which is a good thing, something that we're hoping that will continue again this year. Um, however, one thing I do want to try to highlight is that the majority of these cases, 218, over 70% of these are what we call the neuroinvasive form of the disease, a very serious form of the disease that requires hospitalization. Um, and so a lot of cases go underreported um, or, or just not reported at all. If you exhibit symptoms, uh, you get the flu-like symptom in the middle of summer, you may never go to the doctor and the doctor may never take a blood test and test for West Nile specifically. And so you may still be suffering from that. Um, so CDC estimates that for every neuroinvasive form of the disease, you have anywhere from 30 to 70 other cases that go underreported. So, um, so really, you're talking about tens of thousands of people that have some symptom associated with West Nile and have, you know, have an impact of that. We want to make sure that we're getting that word out and people are taking the appropriate precautions. So how, what do we ask the general public to do? You know, how can you help? Look for standing water, specifically after today's rain is going to fill up quite a number of containers in people's backyards. Uh, we'll be putting out a press release. Uh, luckily, actually, next week is Mosquito and West Nile Virus Surveillance Week in California. Uh, so very timely from that perspective. And we'll be doing a number of different activities. Um, uh, we have a, a, a contest with school children where they design a kind of a calendar page, although nobody uses calendars anymore, so we just put it on the website. Uh, but we give prizes to the classroom and to the individual student. Um, and so we promote that. We've had uh, um, over 3,000 entries over the last number of years from school children um, in Sacramento and Yolo County. Um, that's been an ongoing program that we've had for about 15 years or so, and so very successful. We went, to, again, we used to produce a calendar, which was kind of neat, but nobody ever does that anymore. So, um, But we do give a prize both to the school and to the student. So we try to encourage the teacher um, to get their students to, to submit entries as well. Um, so we ask people to, to do these, uh, to look for this. So again, your gutters are a great source of water um, and, and, and leaf litter and those types of things, organic material that is very um, attractive to mosquitoes per se. Uh, bird baths that are going to fill out that are not cleaned out are great sources. Um, just general drains. Um, I, I am curious about the Sac State parking structure that they said they hold all their stormwater. Um, that may be a problem for mosquito production. We'll have to go check that out. Um, but any low area that you see where water is going to stand for about a week or so can produce mosquitoes. So if you see this, give us a call. We'll come out and take care of it. Things like this we probably are already aware of. Uh, but other things that are in people's backyards are much more difficult for us to find. Those flower pots and um, uh, canisters and uh, tops, lids of garbage cans and old tires. Um, those types of things are very difficult for us to be able to see in people's backyards. Um, I remember one of our technicians a few years ago went to a backyard. The, the resident said that they were just getting hammered with mosquitoes and we went into their backyard and they had 47 washing machines um, in their backyard that of course were all filled with water and breeding mosquitoes and they wonder why they were getting hammered by mosquitoes. Well, here you go. Um, uh, so sometimes it's not quite as intuitive. Um, so while we were scratching our heads going, yeah, here's the answer, you know, sometimes people don't know. And that's what our services are here to try to provide, be able to pinpoint those things out. So we were able to treat those and, and really reduce the pain. And then they called back the next week and they're going, I can't, I haven't seen a mosquito in a while. So good, glad to hear that. Um, 
Again, uh, backyard swimming pools are a big issue for us. We visit about 7,000 pools a year um, that either uh, need attention or not blue pools. And so um, this is a big issue for us as well, uh, making sure that we're getting uh, information out to the residents to, to just let us know. Uh, we don't care whether your pool is blue or green. We just care that it's not producing mosquitoes. So let us go out there and we'll treat it and take care of it. A lot of times we plant mosquito fish in there um, and they'll take care of the problem for the entire summer. So we ask uh, folks, uh, what can they do? We have the, what we call the seven Ds. Uh, again, drain standing water, uh, dress uh, in long sleeves and long pants if you do have to go outside when mosquitoes are gonna be active, that way they can't get through your clothes and bite you. Uh, dawn and dusk are times to avoid being outside. Uh, that's when mosquitoes tend to be most active and specifically the ones that transmit disease um, are going to. Defend yourself with a good repellent. Um, we buy repellent. Uh, like pouches like this, we hand them out at public events and everything else that we go to. Um, we buy the stuff by the pallet, um, so we want it to be used. So if there's something that you have a need, just give us a call. We'll be more than happy to help you out with that. Uh, doors and windows uh, should be in good working order because, again, you're emitting out carbon dioxide. Um, and so if your doors and screens in the summertime are open and there's a hole in there, those mosquitoes will find it. They're crafty. Uh, and then, of course, the, the seventh D is call the district. Give us a call. This is what we are here for specifically. We want to know if you're having a problem. And, uh, and that way we can come out and take care of the, the issue. So again, the very timely for today after the rain, remember to drain. These are the sources that will fill up with water um, that will produce mosquitoes um, in the next few days. And so please uh, let us know or drain those things out in your own backyard. Um, clearly catch basins are another issue for us as people over water and that stuff goes out in the street. Those catch basins, storm drains, um, have a lot of leaf litter as well. They're designed to hold water and so they will hold that water and produce mosquitoes. We have an active program here with the storm drains. We, we check and inspect almost a million storm drains per year, um, treating about, uh, about 200 to 250,000 of them on an annual basis. So it's a, a large effort. You'll see our folks out on bikes, um, walking, all of those types of things. Please don't run them off the road. They're, they're doing the, the best job they can. Um, again, dress protectively. The more clothes, uh, less skin that you have, um, the better off you are in terms of being able to not be bitten by mosquitoes. Um, it's a little tough in Sacramento because we get 100 degree days and, and it's warm and you want to wear shorts and a t-shirt. Um, uh, but if you do, um, you know, make sure that you're either putting on that repellent. Um, again, dawn and dusk are the times to avoid being outdoors. Um, on repellent specifically, uh, DEET is kind of the gold standard. Um, this is all comes from the CDC website. So these are recommendations made by CDC. Um, depends on the percentage that you have. So the higher percentage will last longer. Um, but if you don't need a higher percentage, don't, don't use a higher percentage. If you're only going to be out for an hour or so, a lower percentage of DEET will, will be just fine. Um, the other uh, products that are acceptable for use by, um, by CDC, Picaridin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, um, IR35, which sounds scarier than it is. Uh, but these are all very effective repellents, um, will work. They just don't last as long as DEET will be. So it's just something where you need to reapply for it. And make sure you always follow um, directions. Um, things that don't work, uh, garlic, um, dryer sheets, uh, bananas. Um, I mean, I guess if you, if, if you, if you hit them with a banana, they, they might uh, be one vitamins. Um, you know, not all of these things, these are all kind of wives' tales. They're, they're not proven to, to use um, uh, to be very effective in terms of repellencies. Um, again, uh, doors and windows, mosquitoes try to feed at night. Um, and if your windows and doors are not in good working order, they'll, they'll find you. Um, this is a picture of our facility down in Elk Grove. Uh, we also have an office in Woodland. Uh, and so we have uh, 65 full-time employees that are dedicated towards uh, mosquito uh, control. Uh, and abatement. Uh, and then we also hire about 20 to 25 seasonals uh, right now from April through through September into October because that's when the mosquito season is, is uh, highest upon us. So um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, West Nile virus is a bird disease. So if you do see a dead bird, please report it. Um, it's a state program, actually. It's run by California Department of Public Health. Um, and the phone number 877-WNV-BIRD. Um, you can also go online, westnile.ca.gov. I actually think they have an app as well um, where you can take a picture of the bird. Uh, we'll be able to identify it. That gets transmitted to us, and then we'll send somebody out there to pick it, uh, pick it up, and then we'll test it to see if it died of West Nile or if it had a tire tracks over it. We'll see if it died of a car. Um, but uh, uh, we can test almost, uh, well, we can test any bird, even a bird that's been dead for quite some time. Um, there are still virus um, that we can detect um, even in a desiccated bird. So um, please, if you see one, give us a, uh, give, give that number a call or go to the website and report that bird. Um, that also helps us determine if we have a particular problem in, in an area, if we're seeing a number of dead bird reports in a particular area. 
So again, the seven Ds that we want people to follow, uh, the big one for us, I think, drain standing water, defend yourself with infective repellent, and call the district um, if you're having any problems. And so we have our phone number, 1-800-429-1022, and our website, fightthebite.net. So that's all I have, again, um, and, unless the, the commission has any questions for me. Thank you, Gary. You always have a very informative presentation, and every year you add something new, so we all get something to learn here at this it, point. That, that, that is good. I, I try to put something new in there, and sometimes it gets a little difficult. I don't want to say the same thing over and over again. So, but, uh, but I always appreciate, again, the invitation. We think it's important. We do a lot of presentations to neighborhood associations and whatever groups that we can. Um, I'm actually getting ready for my city council tour, so I go to all the city councils and give presentations as well because we want the people to know um, what, what issues are out there and who they can call. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know who we are. We're sometimes a bit anonymous. Okay. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Buzz? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Gary. I, 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 every time this is very enlightening to me. Uh, and I've been through four or five or six of, of <laughs> exactly. your. But I had a question about um, repellent. Um, uh, I've recently seen uh, a substance called, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, pyrethrin. Py uh, pyrethrin, um, yes. It um, uh, well, per, well. Let me rephrase. Permethrin. Permethrin is used a lot of times in the military and in um, the stuff that you'll buy from REI. And it's not only just a repellent, but it's also it, it's a toxicant. So it will kill um, insects as well. Um, so pyrethrin is a product that we use to kill adult, adult mosquitoes. Um, and so permethrin is used in the intertwining of the fibers when you get the, the military clothing or the REI when you're going out to camping, those types of things, it's impregnated with permethrin. And so while mosquitoes, when they come around to it and they start to detect it, they're clearly going to go away because they know that if they land on it and they take too much time, that, that, that they're not going to make it. So, so it's an effective... It is an effective tool, absolutely, yes. Not, not uh, bounce dryer sheets, yes. It's, it's definitely a very effective tool. Good, thank Any, you. That Tony, we have a question? Anybody else? Oh, Laura? Hi, thank you very much. It was very informative. Um, now, with the birds, I, I actually work at the Wildlife Center, and we get a lot of neurocorvids in, like crows and yellow-billed magpies, and, and you know, they're, they're assuming it's West Nile virus. But I haven't really heard a lot about other birds getting West Nile virus, so what's your thoughts on that? Um, a lot of other birds still carry it. Um, well, corvids are the most susceptible. Corvids and jays, which of course we have in abundance here, right? And that's why West Nile for us is never gonna go away, because we have the right mosquitoes that transmit the disease, and we have the right hosts in terms of the cor corvids and jays and magpies um, that, that, that are the host body for it. Um, uh, we have tested other um, uh, birds. Um, we have, uh, actually, we, part of our surveillance program, we have chicken flocks. Um, chickens will build up the antibody to it, so we'll bleed chickens, um, just a small droplet of blood that we'll take on a weekly basis from the chicken populations that are located, and that way we know we have local transmission, because if we pick up positive virus from those chickens, we know those haven't moved. The, the only problem with birds in general, and of course mosquitoes, is even if we make a collection at a particular site, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where they got infected, right? Birds are going to fly, and, um, and so, but it gives us an idea as to where to try to concentrate, and then we start setting more traps and getting more information out. But other, other birds birds um, can get West Nile. They tend not to be, they tend not to be as great of, of uh, uh, hosts, essentially, as the corvid population does. Um, there's a, a retired um, entomologist from UC Davis, uh, Dr. Bill Risen, who, who called uh, crows flying bags of virus. Um, it amplifies in their system so quickly, so much, that they have so much virus in their systems that when a mosquito bites it, it picks it up very readily. In other bird species, it may still transmit um, and, or, or be in their system, but they may not necessarily be transmittable to the mosquito itself. They may not have enough virus in the I area. See. Um, there was a few issues a couple years ago, specifically in Utah, with bald eagles, because uh, bald eagles were eating other birds that had West Nile, and so they had high, heightened uh, levels of West Nile virus, and they had some bird, some bald eagle uh, die-offs for that, and they were wondering, was that from virus activity, was that from something else? And so they can transmit, or they can get those virus, but sometimes they're just not as um, as potent as the corvids. So that's why we see the remarkable symptoms in the corvids. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I have another question. Sure. As far as the yellow jacket eradication, um, I, I've heard a couple different things. Don't knock the nest down, you know, the nest that they put up in the eaves, you know, of the porches, because they'll come back and build it bigger and stronger. Uh, so I've heard that. And then I've also heard just, you know, just spray the, the nest. 
And so I don't know really what the right answer is for just an average dealing Exclusion with Exclusion is the best. Um, if you can, um, during the day, now you're probably, actually what you're talking about are probably um, uh, paper wafts. Yeah, the, yeah, the little yep. things um, that Yellow jackets are a little different. Yellow jackets will um, uh, create their nests in the ground. Ground, yeah, okay. Um, I'm talking about the ones. Yeah, yeah. The, the other ones that are in your eaves, yes. In the middle of the day is the best time because in the, in the day they go out foraging and they'll come back. So uh, the mud daubers and those types of things that you'll see, yes. Exclusion, knock them down. Down, that's the important that's the best thing to do um, and then of course if you're seeing it they're not going to build it bigger and if, if, if you're not a suitable place for them to build they'll move on somewhere I see else. okay all right so that's the old wives tale yes. another one yep. Yep. okay I think that was oh and um, seasonal vernal ponds that are like we have some actually in our property and the vector people come around that I've seen so if they've already identified it and we just haven't seen them my guess is they're they they'll come back around. Yep, I don't absolutely. need to call them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I said, the 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 uh, slide that I gave that has the, the zone technician, his response, his her responsibility in that area is to go around to each of these sorts sites and sources, typically within a two week process. So um, not, the nice part with the vernal pools is they tend to dry up, yeah. and so then we don't have to worry about them as much. Um, but uh, but there are other sources that that will be year round, and so yeah. So for the most part, we know about them. Okay. Um, feel free to give us a call we'll be more than happy but if if, if you've seen them out there before or, it's yeah. on our list um and uh, and we'll go out and, and revisit um specifically now in the springtime and right, yeah that we, we don't have any trouble with mosquitoes yep. thank you very much great <laughs> does your organization work with uh, uh agriculture and 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 cattle operations where they have open uh, troughs and things like that? A absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the water troughs are great for mosquito fish. Uh, we put mosquito fish in, in the water troughs. Um, they do a great job of, of taking care of the mosquito uh, larvae that will be in there. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do outreach to, to a number of different, we'll try to work with farmers. Uh, again, for us, uh, rice is a big issue. Uh, we've got about 45,000 acres of rice. Um, which is just standing water with vegetation that breeds mosquitoes. Um, and of course, in Sacramento and Yolo County, then you've got population that's right there. And so uh, we work very closely with the Agriculture Department. We work very closely with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We have Stone Lakes down in Elk Grove. Um, and and we, we try to identify and work very closely with them. We have a number of other different products. Um, so next year, I'll talk about maybe our Ecological Management Department uh, that works specifically with those landowners and having MOUs. We also utilize drones. Um, mm. for both surveillance and application. Um, so kind of a new level of technology and, and, uh, and so that'll be, that'll be a good topic next year. Yeah, very good. Any other questions from the commission? Thank you very much, Gary. We appreciate Absolutely. your time. Thank you again for the invitation. Yeah. Have a wonderful day. Nobody ever takes my picture. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, our next agenda item is our Environmental Management Department Director's Report. Sure. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Marie wouldn't ask me to update the commission on the recent um, California Environmental Health Association conference that six of our environmental management department staff attended. Um, there was a real focus on um, recovering from the wildfires and the natural disasters we've had in obviously recently in California. Um, because environmental health departments are so um, involved in the cleanup efforts and the recovery efforts. There were a lot of presentations regarding um, how uh, the counties can support each other, um, how to prevent communicable diseases in um, the disaster centers. Uh, I know there were quite a few norovirus outbreaks, um, which, you know, when you've lost your home, the last thing you want to have to deal with, of course, is, you know, norovirus um, when you're at the shelter there. Um, so it was really, um, there was a lot of discussion around recovery from the wildfires, which was unfortunate, but it was a very good um, display of how much support the counties provide uh, to other counties during um, these wildfires in particular, but other natural disasters that we have in California. So that's one good thing is that we do, the environmental health um, departments throughout the state really support each other. So um, I know we, um, Murray's been very supportive of sending um, staff to the campfire and, and different, um, different fires and nat natural disasters. Um, and then also there were some updates on some of the newer laws, which is uh, AB 
626, uh, which is the micro enterprise kitchen operations, which um, if that's passed by the county, uh, we'll be you know updating the commission on those laws. Um, and then AB 2178, which has to do with charitable feeding. And uh, you'll be getting an update on that law and uh, you know what Sacramento County is doing around that. Um, and th that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, this is an opportunity for any final co comments from commissioners. Does anybody would like to address the commission here? Seeing none, I think then we're ready for an adjournment to our next meeting on May 20th at 6 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you.